Good day, everyone. Uh, I wish to welcome and thank everyone for attending this special session of Rock Science first ever international conference. My name is Tamir Yakub. I am the CEO and president of Rock Science. As many of you know, this year marks our 25th anniversary as a company and as contributors to Geomechanics. We've chosen to commemorate this milestone by hosting an event that celebrates the discipline we love so much. Starting tomorrow, we will be hosting several sessions with over 70 papers being presented by talented academics and specialists from around the world. It is going to be a fantastic event. Like much in geomechanics, the research and discoveries we present this week are only possible because of the hard work, thousands of research hours, and groundbreaking discoveries made by those who came before us. With this in mind, we have gathered today to honor the contributions of one of the most distinguished practitioners in, the, in this field, Dr. Everett Hook. Dr. Hook will be delivering a speech. After his speech, my colleague, Dr. Reginald Hanna, Director of Rock Science Africa, will moderate a question and answer period. You may please enter your questions to Dr. Hook on the conference platform. The entire session will take approximately an hour. The founder of Rock Science, Dr. John Curran, has known and worked with Dr. Hook for many, many years. John has been a leader and a guiding light here at Rock Science. John took a small research group of a grad students at the University of Toronto, over 25 years, grew it into the internationally successful company it is today. I was actually one of those PhD grad students. John has been a mentor, colleague, and a friend to me for many years, and I am pleased to introduce him. He will tell us a bit more about the man we are celebrating today. I now hand it over to John. John. Thank you, Thamer. Bronx Science is pleased to award the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Medal to Dr. Everett Hook, a leading international rock mechanics expert. He's had an enormous impact on our field as a researcher, practitioner, educator, and mentor. Dr. Hook was born in 1933 in Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. He graduated with a bachelor's and a master's in mechanical engineering from the University of Cape Town. In 1958, he became involved with rock mechanics when he started researching brittle fracture problems associated with very deep mines in South Africa. He earned a PhD from the University of Cape Town for this work. Everett moved to Imperial College in 1965 where he set up an interdepartmental rock mechanics center for teaching and research at the Royal School of Mines. He and his colleagues and students were responsible for numerous vital innovations in rock mechanics. Dr. Hook and Dr. Ted Brown developed the Hook-Brown failure criterion for jointed rock masses during this period. The criterion's most significant contribution was to link geological observations to a simple equation with parameters readily estimated from laboratory testing and field characterization. In 1975, Dr. Hook joined Golder Associates in Vancouver as a senior consulting and engineer and principal. His time in Golder was marked by a remarkable ability to apply rock mechanics principles to the solution of real world rock engineering problems. In 1987, Dr. Hook became a research professor of rock engineering at the University of Toronto and I had the good fortune to have an office next to him. At the university, he focused on developing a practical rock mass classification method for the Hook-Brown strength criterion, developing user-friendly programs for practicing engineers, which incidentally helped launch rock science, teaching a new generation of rock in mechanics engineers, and documenting rock mechanics in rock engineering processes and state of practice, which he generously shares on Hook's Corner on the Rock Science website. After leaving the university in 1993, he worked as an independent consultant on review and consulting boards on civil and mining engineering projects worldwide. He did this for 20 years and retired from active consulting in 2013. 
However, Everett remained a member of consulting boards on several major projects on to, until 2018. Dr. Hook is a, is a foreign associate at the US National Academy of Engineering and fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering of the UK and the Canadian Academy of Engineering. His many and distinguished contributions to the field have been recognized by a doctorate DSC from London University, honorary doctorates from the University of Toronto and University of Waterloo, and prestigious awards from all the major scientific societies involved with rock engineering and rock mechanics. Dr. Hook's remarkable career spanning over 60 years has always been guided by the philosophy of seeking practical solutions, no matter how complex the problem. He combines neat, clear thinking with an exceptional grasp of theory, unparalleled ability to break down complexity into manageable, solvable parts, and a knack to explain the entire process in very simple terms. He's published more than 100 papers and three books, including the influential Rock Slope Engineering and Underground Excavations in Rock. Everett's outstanding success as a researcher, practitioner, educator, and mentor has left an indelible mark on rock mechanics. He will continue to inspire and enlighten generations to come. For all these reasons, Dr. Everett Hook has deservedly earned the highest respect and honor of the rock mechanics and rock engineering community. Congratulations, Everett, from all of us on receiving the Rock Science Lifetime Achievement Medal. And I invite you to deliver your keynote titled Developments in Rock Engineering from 1958 to 2020. This keynote address is associated with the start of the Rock Science International Conference 2021, which celebrates the company's 25th year of operation. I'd like to express my appreciation to the company for the award of the Lifetime Achievement Medal and for providing me with the opportunity to make this presentation. The video is divided into two sections. The first one covers the period of 1958 to 1975 when I was involved in research and teaching in rock mechanics. Personal computers and methods of numerical analysis were not available at this time and I'll be telling you how we managed to deal with rock mechanics problems without computers. The second part of the presentation deals with the solution of practical problems in rock engineering. For most of the time from 1975 until I retired in 2018, I worked as a consultant in rock engineering and I'll describe some of the projects that I worked on during this time. As implied by the title of the presentation, my aim is to give you a summary of the evolution and development of rock engineering over the past 60 years. In preparing the summary, my problem has not been what to include, but rather what to leave out. My selection is obviously biased by my background in strength of materials and stress analysis. In contrast to the normal procedure of placing a minimum amount of text on slides for a presentation such as this, I've had to place a large amount of information on the slides to accommodate that which I need to present to you. You'll probably not be able to read most of the text during the video, but I have been assured that the video will be available for download, and this means that you'll be able to watch it again later in your own time, and that you will be able to read all the text that is of interest to you. I was born in the British colony of southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, in 1933. I completed my schooling in 1950, and I then moved to South Africa to study mechanical engineering at the University of Cape Town. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in 1955, I returned to Cape Town and remained there until 1957 to complete my Master of Science degree. For this degree, I specialized in strength of materials and in the use of photoelasticity for stress analysis. This was one of the most powerful tools available to us for the analysis of the distribution of stresses in mechanical components, such as the loaded crane hook shown in this slide. Physical models using transparent materials such as glass or plastic show the distribution of stresses in the model when viewed in polarized light. For my thesis, I studied the three-dimensional distribution of stresses in the threads of a loaded bolt and nut. The study involved machining a model 
from a specially formulated transparent plastic. This model was heated in an oven to a critical temperature while under load and then cooled very slowly to room temperature. The stresses were frozen into the plastic by this process and the model could then be cut into thin slices which, when viewed in polarised light, yielded the photoelastic pattern that you see at the bottom of this slide. In 1958, I was appointed a research engineer in the South African Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in the capital city of Pretoria. My duties were to take care of stress analysis and strength of materials problems referred to the CSIR by government or commercial organisations. Photoelasticity played an important role in this work. In January 1960, a major collapse occurred in the Colebrook Ruminpilla coal mine in South Africa with a loss of 435 miners. The CSR was one of the research organisations that became involved in the investigation of this accident and in the revision of the mine guidelines for coal pillar design. The illustration on the top right shows a Ruman pillar mine layout in an underground mine. The rooms, formed by a cross-cutting series of tunnels, are mined out, leaving the pillars to support the overlying rock mass. The photoelastic pattern was viewed in a thin slice cut from a three-dimensional photoelastic model which had been subjected to the stress freezing method described in the previous slide. These photoelastic models enabled us to study the distribution of stresses in the coal pillars. To calculate the strength of coal pillars, it was necessary to know the influence of the size on the strength of coal pillars. This could only be determined by testing the coal in the mine and I was responsible for investigating and confirming the feasibility of large-scale in-situ coal tests. The upper photograph shows the coal cutting machine, which is basically a large chainsaw, cutting the coal specimen from one corner of a coal pillar. This coal specimen is loaded by several hydraulic jacks at the top of the specimen. The lower photograph shows the intact and failed specimens. These tests were followed by numerous tests on a range of coal pillars of different sizes, reported by Benioffsky and Van Heerden, 1975, and the results of the tests were incorporated into a paper on the design of coal pillars by Salomon and Wagner, 1985. One of the pieces of equipment that I designed was this biaxial loading frame in which 15 centimeter square glass or rock plate models could be subjected to uniformly distribu distributed loads in vertical and horizontal directions. Four opposing hydraulic jacks applied loads through a load spreading device illustrated on the upper right hand side of the slide. Very precise load distributions could be achieved as illustrated by the symmetry of the photoelastic pattern in the glass plate model in which tensile cracks have been induced in the roof and floor of the opening. The illustration on the left showed a vert shows a vertical tension crack and sidewall notches formed by spalling in an intact rock model. Models like this were important since it was possible to follow the initiation and propagation of each type of fracture as it developed. The photograph on the right illustrates the photoelastic pattern in a glass plate model in which three open inclined cracks had been machined by an ultrasonic cutting machine. The propagation of cracks from the tips of these three inclined openings, representing an array of cracks in rock, were part of a study that I did on the fracture initiation mechanism in brittle rock. In 1966, I was appointed as a re reader and then in 1970 as a professor of rock mechanics in the Royal School of Mines at the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. I spent nine years in London. This was one of the most productive periods in my career. I had an outstanding group of graduate students and was able to persuade several international mining companies to fund their research to produce the material required to compile the two books shown in this slide. In the 1960s, the mining industry was expanding the development of large open pit mines. 
since there were no textbooks on the design of rock slopes available at that time, several mining companies were prepared to have my students and I visit their mines and investigate typical problems encountered in creating stable slopes. The book Rock Slope Engineering was published in 1974. During the 1970s, we moved on to investigating similar problems in underground mining excavations. And these studies resulted in the publication of the book Underground Excavations in Rock in 1980. One of the field projects in which my students and I were involved during the Rock Slope Engineering study from 1972 to 1975 was the Panguna Open Pit Mine on the island of Bougainville in Papua New Guinea. This island is located northeast of Australia, as shown in the map on the upper left of the slide. The mine was planned to be a large open pit mine with an eventual depth of approximately one kilometer. Unfortunately, due to land ownership disputes, the mine ceased operation in 1989. Our task was to investigate methods for designing large slopes excavated in the fractured and jointed rock masses of Bougainville. Because of the location of the island on the volcanic ring of fire surrounding the Pacific Plate, earthquakes were common. These had resulted in intense fracturing of the andesite and granodiorite rock masses in which the open pit had been excavated. The fracturing can be seen in the photograph of a mine bench in the bottom of the slide. Another photograph in the left-hand corner of this slide shows the tightly interlocked, heavily fractured rock mass, which we used as a model for the slope design studies. Sample of various grades of this rock mass were collected and shipped to a laboratory in Cooma, Australia, which had a large triaxial cell shown in the photograph in the lower left-hand side of this slide. This cell had been used for testing rockville for dams on the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric project completed in 1974. The results of the test carried out on the rock mass samples from Panguna are shown in the plots on the right-hand side of this slide. It was found that these curvilinear plots could be described by the equation above the plot in the center of the slide. This equation became the key element of the Hook-Brown failure criterion published by Hook and Brown in 1980. When computers and numerical analysis programs became available in the late 1970s, a significant issue was the need to improve, method, improve methods for estimating rock mass properties for incorporation into these analyses. In 1980, the Hook-Brown failure criterion, the origins of which were described in the previous slide, was introduced. The Geological Strength Index, GSI, for categorizing rock masses, developed by Hook and Marinus, followed in 2000. While based on sound engineering and geological principles, it's important to recognize that these criteria are both empirical. Based on practical experience, they have been expanded and modified over the past 40 years, but the results that they produce can only be considered as estimates of the rock mass properties. The plot on the left shows the results of laboratory tests on a variety of intact rock specimens. These plotted lines are for different values of the Hook-Brown constant Mi, which is related to the ratio of intact compressive to tensile strength. Brittle rocks such as dolerite, granite and quartzite have high Mi values, while softer and more ductile rocks such as marbles, shale and mudstones have low Mi values. The Geological Strength Index, GSI, gives a rating based on the structure and surface conditions of the discontinuities in the rock mass, which can be used to estimate the reduction of intact strength values for incorporation into design analyses. GSI ratings for some typical joint masses are shown on the right-hand side of this slide. On the left-hand side, the impact of the value of GSI on the rock mass properties is illustrated. There's a very rapid decline of strength with decreasing values of GSI. 
This has a major impact on the design of slopes, foundations or tunnels in these rock masses. While the process illustrated in this slide is empirical, it has been applied in the field for many years and has been found to provide a sound starting point for the design of structures on or in rock masses. It's important that the behavior of such a structure should be monitored during construction and that adjustments to the design should be provided for in the contract and should be implemented during construction. The feedback from these observations is essential to provide confirmation that the overall design process, including the use of GSI, has been used correctly. Toppling failures in rock slopes occur in rock masses which consist of well-defined blocks of rock. Examples of such rock masses are shown in the photographs with potential top toppling failure shown on the right. A discrete element program for the analysis of toppling failure illustrated in the slide was written and published by Peter Kundel in 1971 when he was a PhD student at Imperial College. He moved to the University of Minnesota in 1972. In 1979, he published an important paper entitled A Discrete Numerical Model for Granular Assemblies in the journal Geotechnique, which set the ground for the development of the distinct element method. This was an important forerunner of the software collection developed by the Itasca Consulting Group, with which Dr. Kundal was associated. I left London for Vancouver, Canada in 1975. I joined Golder Associates, a geotechnical consulting company, and I remained with them until 1987 when I was appointed an industrial research professor of rock engineering at the University of Toronto. I returned to Vancouver in 1993 to set up my own independent consulting company which is still in operation, although I have now retired from active consulting. The red dots on the slide indicate the locations of various mining and civil engineering sites around the world on which I worked as a consultant. There are a few dots that cover multiple sites in small countries, such as this one covering Greece, shown by the red arrow. I worked on numerous projects in Greece, including seven major water supply dams and hydroelectric projects, and a 670 kilometer highway, which includes 73 tunnels. One of the topics that occupied much of my time was the design of tunnels in weak rocks or overstressed rock masses. It was particularly interesting to compare the different approaches adopted by North American and European tunnel designers. In the United States, there was a relatively small demand for tunnels during the first half of the 19th century. Most tunnels that were excavated were shallow and they were generally located in reasonably good rock masses. The standard method of rock support consisted of installing steel sets to support the overlying rock mass. The accepted method of designing the steel sets was based on a paper by Tozogi published in 1946. This method assumes that the rock mass surrounding the advancing tunnel fails to some extent, depending on the properties of the rock mass. The function of the steel sets is to prevent the failed rock mass from collapsing into the tunnel as the face advances. Hence, the capacity of the steel sets installed immediately behind the advancing face is determined by the weight of the failed rock mass to be supported. The drawing on the left of the slide has been adapted from Tozagi's paper, which addresses the estimation of the extent of the rock mass failure above the tunnel and hence the load acting on the steel set. The types of rock mass considered are listed in the table on the right hand side. The rock load on the steel sets is expressed in terms of the height HP of the failed rock mass above the top of the steel set. The method was used successfully in many tunnels constructed throughout the Americas and in many other parts of the world. However, as demonstrated by the example of the Yacambu Kibo Tunnel in Venezuela, which is discussed in the slides which follow, the method is not applicable to deep tunnels in poor quality rock masses in which large deformations can occur. In Europe, 
particularly in Switzerland and Austria, the Alps mountain range poses a significant challenge to tunnel designers. Deep tunnels, which frequently encounter poor quality rock masses, are liable to suffer severe deformation. Steel sets or other forms of rock support must be designed to accommodate these deformations. The design of such tunnels was dealt with in a paper by Rubsevich, published in 1964. The basic assumption of the Robsovich analysis, illustrated in the upper left of this slide, is that failure of the weak rock mass surrounding the advancing tunnel results in the redistribution of the stresses in the rock. This gives a reduction of the pressure required to support the tunnel as the tunnel deforms, shown by the blue line referred to as a characteristic curve in the plot in the lower part of the slide. The support in the form of some combination of steel sets, rock bolts and shotcrete responds to the deformation of the tunnel as shown by the red line in the plot, depending on the amount of deformation which has already taken place before the support is installed and the capacity of the support system, a, an equilibrium point can be reached when the available support pressure matches the support demand indicated by the characteristic curve. Calculation of the characteristic curve and the support reaction curve for different support combinations is discussed in Chapter 12 of Practical Rock Engineering on the Rock Science website, referred to at the bottom of this slide. This analysis has also been incorporated into the Rock Science program, Rock Support. Between 1991 and 1999, I was a member of the consulting board for the Yakambu Keyboard Project in Venezuela. This project involves a concrete faced rockfill dam and a 24.3 kilometer long, 5 meter diameter water supply tunnel through the Andes to deliver irrigation water to a fertile but arid region surrounding the town of Keyboard. Excavation of the tunnel commenced in 1976 from the intake portal in the dam site. The very steep slopes on the downstream side of the dam, the toe of which is just visible between the two peaks, are in a zone of strong silicified phyllite rock mass. The diversion tunnel for the dam, shown in the upper right, was excavated in this rock mass without the requirement for any support. It showed no signs of instability when this photograph was taken about 20 years after construction. Unfortunately, most of the Yakambu keyboard tunnel was excavated in graphitic phyllite rather than in the silicified phyllite in the dam site area. The appearance of the tectonically deformed graphitic phyllite in the tunnel face is shown in the photograph in the lower left. As described in the next slide, the unfortunate choice of a horseshoe shaped tunnel with steel sets embedded in shotcrete and a poorly, and poorly connected uh, final floor proved to be inadequate for the control of the large tunnel deformations. The tunnel excavation component of the project was suspended temporarily in 1999. Work recommenced in 2003 and I was invited to return as an individual consultant. The slide illustrates the condition of the failed tunnels which had to be remined to proceed with advancing the tunnel using a modified support and lining design. Observations during mining of the Yakambu keyboard tunnel showed that support installed close to the tunnel face failed, failed prematurely due to overloading. As indicated in the analysis by Rubsevich in an earlier slide, this problem can be overcome by the installation of support at a greater distance from the face. However, this assumes that the rock mass is sufficiently strong to provide a significant length of unsupported tunnel in which the tunnel workers can operate safely. When the rock mass strength is too low, as was the case in the Yakambu keyboard tunnel, an alternative method is to design the support system to yield a controlled amount before it's called upon to provide a support pressure. Yielding elements in the support system result in activation of the installed support at a greater distance from the face, while providing security for the workers in the tunnel, in the case of premature closure or collapse. 
the support pressure required to stabilize the tunnel is now much lower. The illustration shows yielding support elements in the form of steel sets with sliding joints installed close to the tunnel face and activated where the sliding joint elements close. Details of the design of the support method are discussed in the paper by Hook and Guevara, published in 2009, referenced at the bottom of the slide. The construction of a steel set in the project workshop on site is shown in the upper photograph with the sliding joints units indicated by arrows. Installed sets are shown in the lower photograph where the sets shot created in place except for a one meter gap on each side left open to allow the joints to slide. And ex as excavation of the tunnel proceeded, the sliding sections converged until at approximately 15 meters behind the face, the sliding joints closed and the sets commenced their support duties. The gaps in the lining were shot creed filled once the sliding joints had closed. The tunnel broke through in 2008, as shown in the slide on the lower right. I had no further involvement in the tunnel after this breakthrough. I was invited to Taiwan as a consultant in 1982 to provide advice on the design of the underground powerhouse complex for the Ming Tan hydroelectric project, which was to be constructed as a sister scheme to the Ming Hu project, then under construction and completed in 1985. Both projects are located on the Sun Moon Lake, which is at the geographical center of Taiwan, as shown on this slide. The components of a typical underground hydroelectric complex are shown here. Water from the upper reservoir enters the headrace tunnel, as shown in the upper left of the illustration, passes through the valves and turbines into the draft tubes, which converge into the tailrace tunnel to discharge water back into the river or into a lower reservoir. In the Ming Tan project, the machine hall is 278 meters below the ground surface. It houses six turbines, has a span of 24 meters, and it is 46 meters high. A mushroom-shaped cavern with a concrete arch to support the roof was used for the Ming Hu project and was the first option considered for the Ming Tan project. This design has been used on many projects, such as the Tama II powerhouse in the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric project in Australia, which was completed in 1962, and is illustrated in the photograph on the right. The concrete arch works well in reasonably strong rock masses at shallow depth. However, for more deformable rocks at greater depth, the convergence of the cavern can induce excessive bending moments in the arch. The illustration on the left shows the computer displacements and the resulting spalling failure of the overstressed inner surface of the concrete arch in the proposed Ming Tan cavern. This analysis confirms the designer's opinion that a concrete arch would not be suitable for the Ming Tan cavern, and this option was rejected. The second shape option for the Ming Tan cavern was an ellipse, which gives the most uniform stress distribution in the rock mass surrounding the cavern. While there's little doubt that this is the optimum cavern shape, the designers of the Ming Tan project, who had no experience with the construction of elliptical caverns, were concerned about construction and equipment installation problems that could possibly arise. Consequently, the final choice for the Ming Tan cavern was a simple letterbox shape, such as that illustrated in this slide. The penalty for selecting a letterbox cavern shape is that additional support is required in the tall side walls to support the rock that would have been excavated in constructing an elliptical cavern. Relatively few numerical stress analysis programs were available in the 1980s when the design and construction of the Ming Tan project was being undertaken. I purchased the first commercial version of the Itasca program FLAC 2D in 1986. This program was used on site throughout the design and construction process, and it proved to be very effective and of great benefit to the project. I no longer have these records, 
but the type of information which was important in the design is illustrated in the equivalent rock science RS2 figure shown in this slide. A unique feature of the Ming Tan cavern support design was the suspension of the relatively poor quality faulted rock mass in the roof of the cavern by grouted and tensioned 50 ton cables. These cables were installed from a gallery above the roof and from two construction adits on the sides of the arch, as shown in the drawing A and identified by a red arrow. Downward excavation of the cavern was carried out using 2.5 meter vertical benches with the installation of tensioned and fully grouted 112 ton steel cables with intermediate grouted rock bolts and 150 millimeter thick steel fiber reinforced shotcrete final lining installed during each excavation stage. Note that a construction crane running on crane rails bolted to the cavern sidewalls was available to access the roof and sidewalls from an early stage of construction. An extremely important component of the design and construction of the Ming Tan cavern was the monitoring of extensometers and load cells installed in the arch and monitored during the entire construction process. Results of these measurements are shown in a plot on the right hand side of the slide. These show a rapid increase in deformation and support loads during the initial excavation stages, followed by stabilization as excavation progressed downwards after the excavation of the haunches. This provides confirmation of the adequacy of the support installed in the cavern. It also provides important, an important check on the correlation between predicted and measured displacements in the cavern during excavation in the event that significant discrepancies are observed during early stages of excavation. Adjustments can be made to the original rock mass strength properties used to predict the rock mass failure and deformation patterns. This information is critical in the development and execution of a design that meets the safety and performance criteria set out by the project owners. In addition, it provides a valuable source of information for use in ongoing research into the determination of rock mass properties. Excavation of the lower benches of the Ming Tan powerhouse cavern is illustrated in this photograph with a temporary construction crane in the center of the picture. A complete powerhouse cavern with turbines installed and operating is shown in the lower photograph. One more surprise awaited us on the Ming Tan project. This was a Richter magnitude 7.6 earthquake, which occurred in 1999, nine years after commissioning the project. The epicenter of the earthquake was located in a fault at 12 kilometers from the Sun Moon Lake, as shown in the slide. The earthquake resulted in a large amount of surface damage and a significant number of injuries and deaths. Damage to a dam close to, but not related to the Ming, Pancho, Ming Tan project is illustrated in the photograph on this slide. Apart from some minor cracking in the shot creek linings, there was no damage to the Ming Hu or Ming Tan underground powerhouse complexes. This provides confirmation of conventional engineering practice, which assumes that earthquake damage to underground excavations at depth of more than approximately 100 meters below surface is minimal unless the excavation is located directly on a fault. The Ignatab Highway project in Greece was a major project in which I was involved with Professor Paul Marinos from the University of Athens as a member of a two-man panel of experts from 1998 to 2004. The highway crosses several geological units en route through northern Greece. It forms part of the Trans-European Highway Network it was jointly funded by Greece and the European Union at a total cost of about 6 billion euros or about 8 billion US dollars. It was completed in 2009. The 670 kilometer long Ignatia Highway has 73 twin tunnels and more than 600 bridges. The old road 
similar to that which you can see running along the full hillside, carried a huge and ever-increasing amount of heavy traffic from Europe through the west coast port of Igomenitsa to the city of Alexandropoli on the eastern border with Turkey. The inadequacy of this road prompted the original decision by the Greek government with financial support from the European Union to undertake the Ignatia Highway project. The general design principles for the Ignatia tunnels, which have a traffic on envelope of 8.5 metres wide and 5 metres high, are illustrated in the drawing of the support installed in and around the excavated tunnel. In addition to conventional steel sets embedded in shotcrete inside the tunnel, provision was made for the installation of a series of 12 metre long grouted pipe four pole umbrellas in the surrounding rock mass. This design proved to be effective for tunnels in the worst rock conditions encountered. For tunnels in better quality rock, some of the sport elements, such as the four poles, were simplified or eliminated, resulting in significant cost savings, as shown in the plot on the right. A typical tunnel during construction, showing the top heading supported by 12 metre long four poles, rock poles and shotcrete, with a temporary invert at the top of the bench, is shown in the photograph on the bottom left. The shape of the final tunnel excavation can be seen in the foreground. A final concrete lining, including a concrete floor, was installed after completion of the tunnel excavation. The use of the same design for all tunnels, with modifications where appropriate, proved to be very effective when working simultaneously on several tunnels. Lambra Poulos, 2005, gives the comparative costs of the excavation and initial support for Ignatia tunnels in different rock mass qualities, expressed in terms of the GSI index. This plot is shown on the upper right of the slide. High-grade mineral deposits throughout the world have been depleted and the mining industry has increased its attention to the technology and economics of mining large, low-grade deposits of minerals. A complete discussion on these issues is beyond the scope of this brief presentation. However, it's inter interesting to discuss two examples of large open pit and block cave mining of low-grade copper ore. In 1992, I was invited to Chile to provide advice on the stability of the slopes of the Chukicamata open pit copper mine, which was then about 500 metres deep. I was responsible with Dr. John Reed for the recommendations on the procedures that should be implemented for the collection and processing of geological and geo geotechnical data that should be incorporated into the design of the mine slopes. This was followed by several years of membership of a technical advisory board which was set up by mine management to monitor progress of the slopes and to recommend any changes that were considered necessary. I retired from this panel in 2013 when preparations commenced for the transformation of mine to an underground blockading operation. In this photograph, taken in 2013, the pit was four kilometres long, three kilometres wide, with a maximum depth of approximately one kilometre. The four vehicles at the bottom of the pit are 400 tonne trucks. In the following, following slides, I will be discussing the stability of the east wall on the right hand side of the photograph, as well as the stability of the west wall on the left hand side, which exhibited instability due to toppling failure for many years. In 2012, a review of the stability of a section of the east wall of the Chukicamata pit was carried out by Pedro Verona of Itasca and Felipe Duran of the Chukicamata Geotechnical Department. I was responsible for monitoring this review in my capacity as a member of the Mines Technical Advisory Board. The ge geological and geotechnical data included in this analysis were provided by the database which had been set up in 1992. In 2012, this database included the results of laboratory tests on intact samples and joints 
in the seven major rock types surrounding the open pit, as well as 185 kilometers of borehole core logging and 195 kilometers of bench mapping. Significant structural features are shown as blue lines in the photograph, together with four prism target locations for geodetic surveys of the pit wall displacement. Of particular interest in the study was the stability of the rock mass surrounding the entrance to a tunnel to a conveyor behind the slope, indicated by an arrow near the centre of the photograph. A three-dimensional discrete element model using the Itasca 3DEC program was created to, discuss, to study the displacements of the rock mass behaviour in the face of the east wall. This model incorporated the joint defined rock blocks with rock mass strength and deformation properties being defined by the hook brown and GSI parameters. The major structural features were assigned strength properties defined by the discontinuity property values in the geotechnical database. The computed horizontal displacements in the east wall are illustrated in this slide. The largest predicted displacements are shown in red. The analysis of the slope displacement displacements measured by both geodetic and radar units installed on site suggested that a wedge bounded by major structural features and formed in the rock mass surrounding the tunnel entrance was moving more than the surrounding rock mass. These results were in acceptable agreement with the displacements given by the three-dimensional discrete element model. This provided the geotechnical department with a sound basis for planning remedial action to ensure that the slope and the inclined or conveyor tunnel behind the slope remained stable for the remainder of the open pit operation until the mine was transformed to a block caving operation in 2019. The west wall of the Chukikamata open pit mine had exhibited instability due to toppling movements for many years. This instability was modelled by Kundal 2008 using a synthetic rock mass model illustrated in the lower left hand side of this slide. The model was made up of joints and bonded particles representing intact rock pieces. The joints were based on data from pit mapping while the intact rock strengths were determined from laboratory testing. The model displayed slope behaviour mechanisms consistent with those observed in the actual open pit mine slopes. The upper figure shows the maximum displacements in the model. The depth of movement shown in red is approximately 130 metres. A detail of one of the benches presented in the lower figure shows the horizontal displacements in the rock mass, the opening of tension cracks and the toppling of the upper pit walls. The slope had not collapsed at the end of the model run, but it showed continued creep, which is consistent with the actual slope behaviour. There are now several examples around the world of cases in which large open pit mines, which have reached the depth at which they are no longer economically viable, have been transformed into unground, underground block caving operations. The Chukikamata mine, discussed in the previous slides, is now in the first stages of operating as a block caving mine. The Palabora open pit copper mine in South Africa preceded Chukikamata by about 15 years. An illustration of the results of a numerical analysis of the interaction between the first lift of the underground block caving operation and the original Palabora open pit mine is reproduced in the slide. The analysis was for the prediction of the substance associated with the first extraction level, published by Sainsbury et al. in 2016. The method is now being used to plan the draw of the second extraction level that commenced development in 2020. Potyondi and Kundal, 2004, described the synthetic rock mass as a three-dimensional assembly of bonded spheres using the Itasca bonded particle model to represent the intact rock pieces or blocks. Sliding joints are simulated by embedding a discrete network 
of disc-shaped floors using Itasca's discrete fracture network. This allows the creation of a very large model containing thousands of joints. In addition, the brittleness of the rock mass can be controlled by the number and properties of the bonded particles representing the intact blocks. This model can reproduce the essential features of the initiation and propagation of fracturing in rock and rock masses. Hook and Martin, 2014, quote Professor E.T. Brown, who in a forward to the scoping studies for the application of numerical models to mass mining wrote, in my opinion, the development of the bonded particle model by Dr. Peter Kundal and his co-workers at Itasca represents one of the most significant contributions made to modern rock mechanics research. It is now well established that this model has the ability to reproduce the essential and some more subtle features of the initiation and propagation of fracturing in rocks and rock masses. This video, reproduced with permission from the Itasca Consulting Group, is a simulation of block caving under an existing open pit mine using a synthetic rock mass model incorporated into the program FLAC 3D. This brings me to the close of the formal part of this lecture. I would like to close with a few comments for those of you in the audience who are new in the field of rock engineering or who are considering it as a possible component of a future career. As you may have gathered from the early slides in my presentation, I had no intention of working with rock masses as my principal engineering material. However, having stumbled into this field by accident, I found it to be fascinating, challenging and rewarding, and I have absolutely no regrets for having spent 60 years in this field. In fact, because of the unpredictability of rock masses, I found every problem to be uniquely challenging. The other advantage that I had was the, that the problems I faced from the very beginning of my involvement in rock engineering were real rather than theoretical. Experience, common sense and engineering intuition are just as important as formal knowledge of the fundamental principles of rock mechanics. This leads me to recommend that if you have considered entering this field or you have already graduated with a bachelor's or master's degree, take a break and get out to the field for a few years before continuing your formal education. An alternative is to enroll in a co-op program if offered by your university in which you work part-time with an engineering company or consulting organization during the degree course. You will never regret the time taken to gain this experience that you get from this time out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hook, for taking us through this journey of rock engineering developments over your long and distinguished career. Once again, thank you very much for sharing these thoughts with us. I want to remind everyone that on the conference chats, there is an option to enter questions. So while we start this question and answer session, please feel free to go to that chat section and post any questions you have. Um, we will try and cover as many questions as we can, but if for some reason we can't cover all of them, what Dr. Hook has graciously agreed to do is we can collate those questions, type them up in an email and he'll answer all the questions and then we'll send them out to all participants in an email. So please uh, post your questions and we'll post them to Dr. Hook. Now, just to get us started, and Dr. Hook, you've already spoken about this a little bit towards the end of your presentation. Given your experience, given what you see rock mechanics or rock engineering achieving and the path it is traveling along, what advice would you have for young engineers who want to become well-grounded in this discipline? who really want to become masters of the discipline. Hello? Hello, here I am. Yes, um, Ever, did you, were you able to hear the question? Uh, I, I was able to hear the question and indeed 
as you say, I, I did discuss it at the uh, uh, end of the, of the presentation, uh, because in my opinion, uh, it's essential for a young uh, engineer just, or, or geologist just starting in this field to gain a link between the practical reality of uh, site conditions and the uh, abundance of theoretical uh, and numerical analyses which they've been taught in their courses, assuming that they've already done uh, a first, at least a first degree. Uh, but even if somebody is, is proposing to go into the field just from high school, uh, it's worth considering getting into the field for a one or two year period, uh, getting your hands dirty and learning to understand what are the, the functions, how does a, a site in civil engineering or mining actually work, where does rock mechanics fit into all of this. And uh, so that, that period uh, in industry uh, to me is, is a critical part uh, of the education required uh, in starting in rock engineering. All right, thank you very much, Evet. Then my second question to you is, here we are going a bit um, almost mythical or mystical, but if you had a magic wand to solve problems, which of the current rock engineering problems would you attempt, would you tackle first? Well, when you look at how rock engineering has developed, and I'll, I'll concentrate really on the properties of rock masses and the analysis of these masses, um, you'll be aware that over the, the last 60 years, uh, and as described to a certain extent in the presentation you've just heard, there's been a, a significant development of the understanding of intact rock properties. Uh, we can carry out very well controlled tests, giving high quality results in many laboratories around the world. And so we're not short of information, particularly on intact rock properties. In parallel to that, there's been a good development of methods for uh, uh, obtaining information from rock masses in terms of their nature, character, character geometry, and number of, of joints, faults, shears that uh, break the rock, intact rock, up into a rock mass. And in general, most of our problems in practical rock engineering are in fact uh, related to the rock mass behavior and not to the intact behavior. So the question is, how do you put those two bodies of knowledge together? How do you take the intact properties we've determined in the laboratory and the properties that have been mapped in the field and put them together into a meaningful rock mass model? And that's, that's a very complex problem because there are many, many uh, parameters at, at issue and uh, the uh, methods for dealing with those is not too obvious. Fortunately, during the last 10 or 15 years, uh, there's been a development of the uh, so-called synthetic rock mass, which comes from work done originally under the direction of Peter Kundal in a research project carried out by Itasca to develop a model in which uh, the, the behavior of a jointed rock mass could be adequately modeled. And this has come a long way. And you saw a very good example of it in the last example in the presentation of the Palabora open uh, pit to block caving transition and uh, the quite remarkable ability of the program to predict uh, caving induced by uh, excavation underground and the control of the interaction between the open pit failure and the underground block cave. Obviously, you don't want that process to get out of control. Otherwise, you end up drawing waste material from the, from the surface. And uh, uh, this is a very exciting development. We have a long way to go because the, the uh, operation of the programs is not a trivial process at all. It requires somebody with a very solid understanding of the origins and, and the operation of the synthetic rock mass model, which is uh, run through, through the Itasca process uh, using uh, um, generally uh, uh, 
uh, 3D programs. And uh, so it requires a, a, a very good understanding of the process of the model and a very good intuitive feel of how uh, you put the parameters into the model to generate a real rock, rock mass uh, behavior. The model itself is very demanding of computing time. Uh, it runs quite slowly, but this is not unusual. We've been there before with the earlier development of models like finite element uh, analyses of slide or, or RS3. Uh, in the early days, these were, were went through the same uh, birth pains as it were. Uh, but I'm very hopeful that eventually the synthetic rock mass will provide us with an extremely powerful tool for studying real rock mass behavior. Thank you very much, Dr. Hook. Now I'm going to give you a few questions um, from the participants. One of the and, um, participants would like to know, what are the biggest technical and professional challenges you faced in your career? That's the first question. What are the biggest professional and technical challenges? And technical facing? challenges, yeah, that you faced in your career. Oh, in my career? Yes. Um, I would say in general, uh, you'll, you'll have noticed from the examples I've given, uh, the size and complexity of some of these projects that I've worked on has been enormous. Um, if you take the uh, 670 kilometer long Ignatia Highway uh, running across Greece, uh, which I worked on for about six years, um, obviously this is not simply a rock mechanics question. You're talking about a very complex uh, interaction between a, a vast number of contractors, uh, planning authorities, route uh, choice based on, on uh, uh, government allocations of, of uh, land prop, uh, value. And uh, so that the, the geotechnical component is actually in total terms quite a small one. Nevertheless, a very important one because uh, the worst thing you can have on a project like that is a failure of some kind, failure of tunnels or failure of slopes or whatever. So that it's necessary to be extremely careful in working with that. And clearly this can't be done by one person. There were, uh, I would say probably a hundred people related to the geotechnical operations on that total project, which was built with simultaneous work on, on uh, maybe 10 tunnels at a time. And uh, all Marinas and I were, members of the consulting board, and we visited the site about every three months or so. And uh, that, that was as complex and as, as interesting a project as I've worked on. But many of the others have the same type of, of characteristics. Excellent, Dr. Hook. Another question, uh, this might be a quick one to answer, but would you recommend junior engineers to get master's degrees after a few years of field experience? Uh, I, I would say yes, um, because uh, the the bachelor's degree that you've that you've done, whether it be in engineering geology or civil engineering or mining engineering, uh, the component of uh, rock mechanics in those mainly around the world is quite small. So that uh, the, the knowledge you need to to uh, deal with complex problems in the field of rock engineering, if that's going to be your career, is probably not adequate. Um, finding a, a master's degree might not be that easy because there are not that many around the world, but uh, there are good ones and they're well worth participating in uh, and getting a master's degree. But as I've said, uh, at some point, you've got to get into the, into the field, whether that's before you do the master's degree, in other words, between the two degrees or immediately after the master's degree. Uh, I think that's an essential component of the educational process. Thank you very much, Dr. Hook. Another person is asking, have you adapted the hook ground criterion to bearing capacity applications? For example, when you have massive foundations, these new wind turbines have massive foundations sitting on the rock. Can you adapt the hook ground criterion to a problem like that? Uh, I, I have done relatively little work in foundations. I've done some. Um, and, uh, uh, for example, I did a study of uh, a cable anchor for a very high, large bridge in Greece, 
uh, and the cable anchor is in effect a foundation of sorts. The, the forces are lateral rather than vertical, but it's, it's still a, a foundation problem. Uh, and the, the hook ground criterion is used in exactly the same way that you would use it for any other purpose. So there's no need for a specific adaptation towards um, uh, foundation problems. I, I would say that there hasn't, there hasn't been much published on how on practical examples of foundation analyses. So to a certain extent, if that's your field, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, as I say, the hook round criterion doesn't change, but how you use it uh, is something that's still got a long way to develop. All right. Well, thank you very much, Evan. And yet another question. What are the challenges to professors of rock engineering? What, throughout your career, what would you say that are some of the challenges they face and how best can they help students master the discipline? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's an awkward one to answer because I'm probably talking to a number of them. Um, but from my own experience, um, and obviously there's a lot of practical reality in, in my background, um, if you can uh, make the, the uh, coursework that is presented as practical as possible, uh, that I would say is a, is a very high priority because this is above all a practical field. And uh, what, what I used to do was to try and, and uh, if, for example, at a master's degree level with uh, a, a, a significant number of students, uh, form teams of uh, students who would then be given an assignment to, uh, to, to study and solve a fairly realistically defined problem, carefully defined, but, but with enough unknowns that they had to uh, use their imagination and experience and education to try and figure out what information was necessary, how was it then used uh, to arrive at a solution, whether it be a slope stability analysis or a, or a tunnel design or a cavern design, or in some cases, a foundation design, not many of those. Um, so, so relating uh, the end use of the knowledge that they're being taught, and, and that is available today in abundance. If you read the literature, it's absolutely saturated with uh, uh, solutions uh, of uh, a numerical uh, mathematical style. Um, and it's necessary to balance that with a link to the real world. And the, the, it's, not, it's not simple unless you have a lot of practical experience to teach practic practical problems directly by lecturing. But uh, if, you, if you do that by setting projects, uh, and there are plenty of these available in the literature that you can use, uh, so that the, the student is, if you like, artificially involved <clears throat> in dealing with real problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a, that's a link that uh, is missing, in my view, in many courses. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Evan. There is a question on, so you described some of these uh, new, um, you know, large open pits that are converting to block caving situations. Um, somebody is asking, so how do you construct or design good field investigation for such projects? How do you measure the stresses in particular if you are dealing with projects like that? Well, <clears throat> you have to realize that before you can go into block caving, there's a lot of work you have to do to develop uh, the underground uh, infrastructure, the shafts, the, the uh, haulage routes and so on that you need to get to the block caving operation, uh, which would probably occupy uh, two, three, five years. And in many cases, if you're working as in the case of Palabora or Chukikimata under an existing open pit, that might already have been running as in the case of Chukikimata for a hundred years or so. So there's a huge amount of information uh, available to you either from previous work on the site itself or from work that you have to do to develop the the uh, uh, the access now the the critical part of the of the operation is the design of the actual draw points their their spacing their layout their elevation uh, their capacity uh, but that that can come 
you can afford to wait a little bit to finalize that, uh, that design. You might have to choose the area in which you, you plan to induce caving, but the actual detailed design of the, the draw points and so on uh, can be delayed a little bit until you've got enough information on the rock mass properties. In, in most cases, you're dealing uh, with relatively hard jointed rock. You're not dealing with, with soils or very soft materials because that, that, that is a real problem if you get uh, major faults or so on in, in deep underground mines. Uh, that's a special problem. So in general, you're working in relatively high quality rock masses. And the, the uh, information you need for that is, is quite easily available by mapping the shaft as you go down the, the, the uh, access roads as you develop them. So that uh, it, it's almost natural that this evolves as you, as you work your way through the project, because it's gonna be a long time in getting from surface to your first active block cave. I mean, that's probably a, a four or five year process. And there's a lot of time in there to learn what you need to learn. Okay. And it's also, I should also add, if you can find somebody with real experience in block cave mining in the geotechnical side of it, it's worth getting some consulting advice from somebody who's been there and done that before. There are not too many of them around, so they're not easy to find, but it's worth going that route if you can. Okay, so well, thanks a lot, Everett. And there was a question that came not on a platform, but through an email that said, in all your publications with Dr. Ted Brown, you state that the hook ground failure criterion should not be used until the potential for structurally controlled failures have been eliminated. It is apparent that many practitioners either do not understand this or choose to ignore it and use other aspects of the criterion, such as the D factor to get the modeling results they seek. That is the ignore geological structure. Do you have any suggestions on how to overcome this industry gap? Uh, yes, I can. And, and I can illustrate it by an example that was quoted in the, at the tail end of the paper, where we were looking at the east face of the Chugakamata mine and the uh, uh, analysis of the, the rock around the, the entrance to a tunnel that goes to a, a, a conveyor transfer chamber. And in that case, um, uh, let me first of all deal with the, the question of the blast damage factor D. This was a late comer into the hook ground criterion, and it was involved literally to deal with blasting and nothing else. Uh, blasting and to a certain extent relaxation due to movement of the, of the rock mass in the, the crest, but it's, it's very local. Uh, I've seen it applied to entire rock masses, and that is totally incorrect. That is not what it's intended to do, and it does not work, uh, because it's, it's really intended to look at a blast where the defect at, at the blast face itself would be one, and would grade down to zero at a distance of, uh, depending on the size of the slope, uh, maybe a, a fifth or a, or a tenth of the height of the slope behind the, the face. So it's a thin strip of rock behind the slope or behind the, the walls of a cavern that has been damaged by blasting. Don't use it as a, as a general tool for trying to, to uh, scale down the rock mass properties. That's much better done by the GSI number that you, you choose to use. So that what you want to do then, uh, where you have a, a situation like we had at Chuki Kamada that was illustrated in the, in the example just before the end of the presentation, uh, we had a, 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 a thousand meter high slope that we were looking at. We were looking at perhaps 300 meters in detail, 300 meters high, that's a big slope. So that in general, in that slope, the rock mass although the, the, the blocks might be one or two meters in size, it's still like a granular material. So it's justified to treat that as a hook brown material characterized by GSI. However, running across that slope are several major shear zones or faults, which cannot be uh, hidden in the, 
in the GSI system. So what we did there was we built a model uh, and it was done by uh, Pedro Verona of Atasca and Felipe Duran of the, of the mine geotechnical staff. Uh, this was a, was a uh, um, I think it was done in FLAC 3D and uh, with uh, the rock mass determined by a, a, a hook brown criterion with uh, GSI numbers determined from mapping and the, the uh, features which were shown in blue on those slides, if you remember seeing those lines, were put in explicitly. So those were, were overlain on the rock mass. And that's relatively typical of how I would do that. The extent to which one dominates the other depends obviously on the problem. You could have a rock mass, which is, as I, and I worked in some of them, where it's almost intact and where there is no rock mass failure involved. It's all either intact failure or structurally controlled wedges and blocks. The other end would be where you have a, uh, a rock mass that's heavily broken up. And there, there are in fact no major structural features where you can treat it as a hook brown material exclusively. So somewhere in the middle uh, lie most of the problems that we deal with. Okay, so well, thank you very much, Evan. And we still have a few questions that we could have gone through, but like all good things, nice things, they come to an end. We are um, at the end of the session. However, we promised that questions that have been asked, and if you have any extra ones, you can please email them to us. We'll send them to Dr. Hook, who has, as I said, agreed to answer them, and then we'll disseminate them to all participants in the conference. But again, thank you so much. And at this point, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tamar Yakub to take over the rest of this session. Could, could I just interject before you do that and uh, say something that I, I should have said at the beginning of my, my uh, uh, discussion with you, but you didn't give me a chance. And that is the, the, to thank Rock Science uh, immensely for, for the honor that you've provided for me, uh, for John Curran's excellent uh, presentation at the beginning, telling you a bit about my history and for the award of the, of the, uh, uh, the, the medal that you've given to me. So thank you very much, Rock Science, for that. And thank you very much, Dr. Hook, for your time. Dr. Yakub. That's great. Uh, on behalf of Rock Science family, uh, I really want to thank you, Dr. Hook, for sharing your time, knowledge with us, your many contributions to rock engineering have proven to be uh, extremely beneficial, and not only for rock science, but for the entire rock engineer community. And you've seen from the questions are, uh, you are a mentor and you, you did an amazing job throughout the 60 years of your career. With that being said, we want to again extend big congratulations on the Lifetime Achievement Medal. Congratulations, Everett. Thank you. I, I also want to thank everyone who will be contributing to the conference over the next two days. Uh, the theme of this year is evolution of geotech, 25 years of innovation. We, ho we hope events like this will provide opportunities for many conversations and learning and spark uh, new ideas that will help uh, move the industry forward. Uh, we are very excited about what will be coming over the next two days and I look forward to welcoming you to the Rock Science International Conference 2021. Enjoy uh, the rest of the day and see you all tomorrow. Once again, thanks, Everett, for your precious time. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.